Next, from Springfield, we go one-on-one -on -one with freshman Congressman Rodney Davis and hear his thoughts on the use of military force against Syria. We also talk about the upcoming debate over raising the nation's debt limit, Obamacare, and his thoughts on funding new locks and dams on the Mississippi and Illinois rivers. This runs about 30 minutes. Congressman Rodney Davis, thanks for joining us again on the Illinois Channel. Thanks for having me, Terry. Great to see you again. You know, as we tape this, you're in the, uh, what's called the August recess. You're going to be going back to Congress uh, next week and uh, perhaps uh, facing, uh, at that time, one of the more crucial votes that perhaps you've taken in your early career. Everyone is talking about what's going on in Syria. Uh, as we sit here at this date, do you know how uh, you would vote on that issue? Well, first off, um, let me tell you, I wish that we were back in Washington right now actually discussing and debating the Syria resolution because it's that important. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, what we're going to do is go back next week and hopefully we won't delay important parts of the domestic agenda that we need to take care of too. Um, I, I will tell you, as a new member of Congress, this is probably going to be the most difficult vote, vote I cast. Any time that I'm asked to stand up and cast a vote to send our men and women into harm's way, uh, I take that very, very seriously. Right now, Terry, I don't think the president's made the case that we need to send American, America's military into Syria, either via air war or via boots on the ground. And frankly, that's the main problem. He hasn't convinced me or the American people what his end game is. And, and that, I think, frustrates me because we shouldn't use our military just to send messages. When the American military goes into a foreign country, American military should have one objective, to win. And we don't know what the objective is right now. You know, I find it somewhat interesting just as a political observer that uh, so many times there are issues that are down party lines, and this one is not. Uh, you have Republicans, uh, John Boehner, the Republican leader in the House, uh, siding, and Eric Cantor, the number two Republican, siding with Nancy Pelosi on this issue. Uh, that almost never happens. Uh, Adam Kinzinger, one of the uh, other Illinois congressional candidates, is uh, in favor, as I understand his position, of using military force. So it's, uh, it's not predictable. Your old boss, John Chimkus, is, uh, as I understand it, uh, against uh, the strike. You know, one thing I've, I've wondered, though, if, if you have, as we have had, a prohibition against using uh, gas after World War I, um, and Syria was warned by the president not to use it, that that was the infamous red line the president drew, um, not for the president's sake, but does the president have a point on an international basis as a community of man? At, at what point do we uh, maintain international order if someone uh, violates what has been international standards. Uh, it's almost like if you hear a couple arguing, that's one thing. But if uh, the husband starts beating the wife up, do you intervene? At what point do we intervene as a community of man? Well, I don't think anyone would disagree that uh, Bashir al-Assad is a genocidal maniac. Anybody that uses chemical weapons or any weapons for that matter on their own citizens uh, needs to be reined in. The problem I have right now is what's the plan to do that? And that's where I think the president and his administration have failed miserably. Uh, just last week, they talked about the urgency of going in to send a message to, uh, to President Assad without any idea of telling us what that message is going to be, what's that end game, and how is it going to prevent him from utilizing those chemical weapons again on his own people? That's what we in Congress have to get answers for out of this administration. Uh, the president yesterday walked away from his own red line that he drew. Uh, I think he has been a disaster when it comes to foreign policy. This is a man who was given the Nobel Peace Prize before he was even sworn into office. And history may judge him very harshly on the success or lack thereof of his foreign policy initiatives. You know, we're we are not getting the support of the international community that we need to go in unilaterally. And that's what frustrates me as a new lawmaker. Where's the United Nations on this? 
you know, what are they doing to actually try and ensure that we have an international response to the, the genocide that President Assad's committing upon his own citizens? And why is it America's job to go in and be the policeman of the world and then face the criticism for doing so afterwards? And again, we have to see why the president wants to go in and how he plans to do so. And the American taxpayers have yet to see that, and neither I have yet to see that myself, too. I don't want to spend all of our time on, on Syria. Uh, by the time this airs, perhaps something will also have been done or a vote may have been taken. But uh, as we again, as we taped this just yesterday, uh, the uh, Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State were testifying. That, you know, they were saying that there will not be boots on the ground. We're not putting in ground forces. This is uh, more along the lines of President uh, Clinton sending in some cruise missiles after uh, the bombing in Africa and some of the other instances where uh, maybe the Balkans where it was an air campaign only. Um, is uh, if, if that were the case, if it was to basically uh, punish uh, Assad's government for the use of chemical weapons, is, have, you, have you thought about where you would come down on the boat if, if there was no ground forces? Is that something that would sway you? Or, or where are your thoughts just as far as what's the, what's the balance of voting for it versus against it? Well, instead of hypotheticals, I'd like to see what the president's plan is. If Secretary Kerry and Secretary Hagel come and testify in front of our committees and say that there will be no boots on the ground, okay. Then what is your end game? What is your goal? Is it just to fire a couple of cruise missiles over there to send a point? How does that stop a genocidal maniac like Assad from grabbing the leftover chemical weapon stockpiles that he has that we are not telling the American people we're going to go after? What stops him from doing it again if he survives that message attack of getting a few cruise missiles and, and losing a few command and control centers. Uh, that's what frustrates me as a policymaker. America's pretty war weary right now. And if this was such an urgent matter, I don't think the president would have asked Congress to weigh in when Congress really doesn't need to, and then decided to go off and play 18 holes of golf. I mean, that's like me telling you, Terry, I'm gonna punch you in the nose, but I'm gonna do it two weeks from now. Uh, probably going to find a way to make sure that it doesn't happen. And right now, what is happening is you're seeing Bashir al-Assad take measures prepping for this American attack via air. And how, how successful is it going to be because of the president's failure in foreign policy? It just frustrates me. You know, uh, one last question on this. Uh, what are your thoughts of just the, the executive office, the president as commander-in-chief? Uh, it seems to me he could have just uh, issued this attack order without having to go to Congress. Does it weaken the presidency that he's asking Congress before he sends in cruise missiles? Uh, you know, I was just recalling the use of force. Again, President Clinton didn't ask Congress permission before sending in cruise missiles. President uh, Reagan bombed Libya on his own accord. President Nixon bombed Hanoi in December of 72, the 24-hour Christmas bombing on his own accord as Commander-in-Chief. Uh, when you're not sending in ground forces, uh, President Bush, uh, 41, did go to Congress before we went in to uh, liberate Kuwait. Uh, should the president be asking Congress, or should he have just uh, taken, if he thought it was necessary, taken the military steps that he thought were necessary? Well, I'm glad he's asking Congress. I, I think it's a timing issue. I don't know why he's not asking Congress to make a decision this week. If it was so urgent last week, when he decided to want to launch a military attack, why did he and Joe Biden decide to go play golf Sunday instead of standing up on TV demanding that members of Congress like me get on airplanes and come back and decide this issue? Uh, that's what frustrates me the most, Terry, is that there's a sense of urgency and then it's, oh, well, let's wait for Congress. I, I just hope this isn't a political blame game uh, because we all agree that chemical weapons being used anywhere in this globe is an affront to humanity. And yeah. we need to make that, we, we need to make it a priority, but we also need to know how we send that message. And, and the, frankly, again, the president's failed to do that. Uh, I wanted to move along to another issue that we're going to be coming up on uh, September 11th is just around the corner. It's going to be the one year anniversary of the attack on the uh, consulate in uh, Benghazi. And people know that they're still frustrated. They don't know what's going on. And we all 
more or less know the story about how the administration made the case it was about a videotape. Now there's questions that they knew all along. It was a terrorist attack from the first moments of the attack. Uh, tell us your thoughts on that and to what extent are you as a member of Congress getting any information and, and to what extent are you satisfied or frustrated by the progress of that investigation? Uh, I'm not satisfied with the answers that Congress or the American people have been getting from this administration on Benghazi. Uh, you, you correctly laid out what happened last year in the midst of a presidential campaign, in the midst of a congressional campaign that I was running where we were told that this attack was based upon uh, something that it wasn't. It was clearly a terrorist attack on the anniversary of the worst terrorist attack on American soil. Uh, that should have been addressed back then. And what frustrates me though, Terry, uh, and this is this actually lay goes into what I consider the failure of this presidency when it comes to foreign policy, is what measures have been put in place by this administration to ensure that another Benghazi doesn't happen. That's the answer that, Amer that the American people want. It's not who's going to, to be blamed for not sending in uh, uh, air power, not sending in other uh, uh, rescue missions. It's, it's about how do we make sure that Benghazi doesn't happen again and, and innocent Americans don't lose their lives. And I don't think that the president has put procedures in place to ensure that that doesn't happen again. Uh, Benghazi is indicative of why the world and the international community doesn't trust the United States to actually be honest and open and that's I think affecting what is happening right now with the Syria debate too. You know let's take it uh, for those uh, the viewers uh, just to remind them that you you're while you're a new member of Congress you had been a congressional staffer for a number of years and so a lot of the experience of being in Congress is not new to you just new as being a member, but you know how the system works. But on issues like this, take us just a little bit behind the scenes. To what extent, whether it's on Syria or Benghazi, how are you, or does the White House reach out and give members of Congress any kind of a briefing, or are you basically getting all your information through the news media, or how, how is it that uh, a member of Congress has kept up to speed on this information? Well, most of the time, it's just through the normal media outlets that everyone else sees. Uh, we were offered uh, in, in a very uh, hasty manner, a classified briefing opportunity uh, last Sunday. Uh, we were told late Saturday that we could go out to get that briefing. Um, Did we you have to be in Washington to get it? Or? Would have had to have been in Washington to get that briefing. So uh, since members of Congress are on their August recess, it would have been virtually impossible to get out there in time at the last minute. Well, some of the, some of my colleagues did go, and, and I conversed with them after they, they saw that briefing, and, and each one of the each one of my colleagues that I spoke with said that the evidence that was presented did not change their viewpoint, that we still don't know what the president's plan is on Syria for, on Syria for, uh, for uh, victory uh, and, and to ensure what the goal is. Uh, Benghazi, uh, I got to give Daryl Issa and his committee a lot of credit for slowly pulling in the evidence after and witness after witness in regards to Benghazi, the ones that he has access to, uh, to talk about the failures of American foreign policy when it came to the attack on our consulate in Benghazi. Uh, I will give the president credit for shutting down the embassies and consulates and throughout the globe a few weeks ago because you know, no one's going to know whether or not he was successful in, in stopping a terrorist attack because no one died. And unfortunately, in a terrorist attack, the only metric you have for success or failure is when somebody lives or dies. And I have to, I have to defer to the administration and the intelligence agencies that that was a good decision. And that's what we in Congress are willing to do and give this president and this administration a leeway to make decisions like that. But then when it comes to failures like Benghazi and, and when it comes to making the case against Syria, and we also demand the same respect and the same answers that, uh, that we're not getting. Let me move along just before one, one other issue that has to do with national security. Uh, when you talk about the consulates that were shut down, this brings us back to the issue of what, what does the government know and how does it know it and where do we draw the line between national security and personal privacy and the whole thing. You know, people will be putting on Facebook uh, kind of joking around saying, you know, did you enjoy my emails today, NSA, you know. What do you think of uh, of that and the NSA and, and this whole thing that came out of the uh, revelations of the 
release uh, by Snowden of some of the nation's secrets. But on the other hand, should the government be engaging in the uh, monitoring of communications in the form that it does? And the government says it doesn't individually read emails, it doesn't individually listen to phone messages, but uh, that they more monitor this to see patterns. Uh, and, and from there they move forward. Well, this issue is uh, an issue where we have had some classified briefings when it comes to Section 215 of the Patriot Act and, and how Section 215 has stopped terrorist attacks. Uh, these same type of briefings we're going to get when we get back to Washington regarding Syria. Again, I wish we were back this week uh, actually voting on this resolution. But when you talk about the NSA surveillance programs, first off, I view my job as protecting American civil liberties. And I believe the NSA overreached uh, in the authority they have under Section 215 of the Patriot Act. And, and I've clearly have a voting record that, that reflects that. Uh, don't get me wrong, Edward Snowden, I think, is a criminal. I think he needs to be tried here in American courts, and I hope that he's extradited back to America quickly uh, so that uh, he, can, he can be tried for the crimes that I believe he committed by taking that information. And whether you agree or disagree, I find it ironic that Edward Snowden, the man who talks about the lack of America's civil liberties, is now housed in a country like Russia, who uh, I, I would put our, our freedom of the press and, and our freedoms in America up against that country's freedom of the press and freedoms uh, that, that their citizens don't enjoy any time. Uh, Section 215 uh, needs to be updated according to the gentleman who wrote the Patriot Act, my colleague Jim Sensenbrenner. There was a recent amendment that I voted for that uh, would have actually changed Section 215 and I walked up to Mr. Sensenbrenner on the floor before I cast that vote and I asked him w how he was going to vote, what he thought of Section 215 and he said, I wrote the Patriot Act and I think it needs tightened up. So that's why I cast that vote and that's the type of vote that I'm going to continue to cast until we are sure that we're able to utilize the systems that have been put in place to focus on those who want to hurt and kill Americans and not focus upon just getting metadata of innocent American citizens. You only have, what, something like nine days before, what is it, the new uh, budget year starts on October 1st, is that how, uh, and you would, we had talked uh, previously that uh, there were other issues you thought you would be addressing one of them is going to be coming up uh, actually in about mid-October, and it probably won't come up until then. You're going to be having to face the raising the debt ceiling debate. Um, <clears throat> it's basically just like on a family's credit card uh, spending limit that if you don't authorize more borrowing, the government won't be able to borrow more. And since we continually run a deficit, we have to borrow more to uh, finance the uh, government going forward. Do you know how you would vote? And just walk us through your thoughts right now as far as when we come up to that debt ceiling debate. Uh, you know, the president, of the, I should say, uh, Jack Lew, the budget director, uh, President Obama's budget director, said the president is not going to have a debate on this, that Congress should just raise the debt ceiling, and that would be the end of it. What, what are your thoughts? Well, I disagree with Jack Lew, and I disagree with the president. Uh, we're not going to give this administration unbridled uh, access to America's debt when we're already sitting at $17 trillion in national debt, which is one of the main reasons why I ran for office. I agree we have to pay our bills here in America, and, and I voted for an increase uh, that was coupled with the no budget, no pay provisions back in February. And we need to make sure that we leverage some spending reductions by this administration and by those in the, in the Senate and in this Congress who want to continue to spend way beyond our means. Uh, that's why I'd like to get back to what we call regular order, our normal appropriations process. Uh, that, then it gets us away from all of these deadlines and fiscal cliffs and, and sequestration and countdown clocks. And it allows individual legislators to have a say on the different policies and procedures that are in place, but also 
it gives us more of a say on, on where to cut and how we can reprioritize the way Washington spends money. And when we do that, Terry, uh, we're also able, I think, to cut more than the 2% that sequestration did, but do it in a way that's not a meat cleaver approach. Do it in a way that's going to continue to fund our Head Start programs and, and ensure that, that people get access to the benefits that they need, but also cut spending in areas where we might not need as much. And, and that's the only way to get back to it. And I'm afraid that Congress has been working off of continuing resolutions virtually the entire Obama administration. And there are people in Congress who don't know anything else. And, and I find myself as a new member of Congress with some experience uh, working when Congress used to govern, explaining to many members who have more seniority than me that if we get back to the regular appro appropriations process, you can have much more of an impact on the policy issues that you tell me you want to drive forward each and every day. Uh, but it's an educational learning curve because they've seen nothing else. And if we here in America continue down this pathway of just offering up continuing resolutions and temporary spending measures, uh, our forefathers' system that was set up uh, with the House, the Senate, and, and the President uh, will forever be changed. You know, one thing I think a lot of people don't understand about the federal budget is the extent to which it uh, operates on automatic spending. It's like spending on cruise control. Something like 60% of the federal budget is entitlement spending. So it just isn't where Congress almost even addresses that. You have Medicaid, Medicare, uh, food Social stamps. Security, food stamps. And those programs uh, just continue to grow. And Social Security, um, actually all of those will, uh, especially as the uh, aging of the baby boomers come. Yeah. Uh, you have the Department of Defense is about 19% of the federal budget. So on the, I mean, that is technically a discretionary spending, but I don't know to what extent anyone's going to be cutting back on the Defense Department. Uh, so you really come down to things like education, transportation, and these other programs that are about 20% of what we call of the federal budget, that we call discretionary. How are we as a society ever going to get our hands around the federal deficit if we don't enact entitlement reform? And is there any thoughts among your colleagues in Congress? Do they recognize the, the, the threat, the financial threat, uh, is there a discussion about, yes, we ought to take on entitlement reform and, and address it, or is that just going to be something that we continue to kind of kick down the road until there's a major crisis? No, I think there are some in Congress who, who make that their top priority. As a matter of fact, I listened to the president uh, when he came to visit us for the first time in his administration in the Capitol, uh, spoke to the Republican caucus of the House. Uh, he mentioned that he was in favor of a change CPI proposal and entitlement reforms. Uh, but you mentioned discretionary spending. Uh, we passed a budget that balances in 10 years. It's a great vision for America. It's a great the framework. Say, yeah, the okay, House budget. passed the a budget. Yeah, the Senate didn't pass a budget in over four years, <clears throat> and we forced them to have to pass a budget, and they did, and it never balances. I love the contrasting visions for America that our budget has versus theirs. Our budget also entitled, it, it, it reforms Medicare in a way that current beneficiaries and near current beneficiaries are not even affected. The same systems in operation. And, and oh, by the way, the exact same Medicare system will be in operation for future generations. We will save Medicare from its bankruptcy, which is going to happen in less than 11 years, according to actuaries. We, we're doing that by giving younger people more options besides the current system, which saves taxpayers billions and prolongs and protects the viability of our very important, very crucial Medicare care system that we have today. And we need to have the long-term vision to not just get caught up in politics, but make sure that these very successful entitlement programs are around for future generations. Because right now, without some major decisions, uh, Social Security is projected to go broke in 2032, and Medicare in less than 11 years. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, often we have this debate, and it's as if one side says, uh, you want to take money out of grandma's mouth, uh, or as we see in the commercials, a uh, Paul Ryan, the House Budget Committee chairman, uh, look-alike, literally had uh, him throwing grandma off the cliff. For the viewers, the whole point of the Illinois Channel is to educate people on what's going on in government, and 
politics aside, the actuaries who run these systems are the ones that are telling everyone who reads their reports uh, that the current systems are not sustainable, that they will go bankrupt uh, unless yeah. changes are enacted. So something will have to be done, or the current systems, as you just pointed out, uh, will collapse of their own accord. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, you, you look at our budget, uh, it lays out a plan to ensure that no beneficiary, no promises that were made to retirees or near retirees will ever change. Uh, and, and that's something that the leaders in Springfield ought to take a look at. When you talk about uh, Springfield and, and the pension reform issues, you know, promises were made to individuals when they signed up and they made career decisions based upon those promises. Those promises need to be kept, just like they need to be kept with Social Security and Medicare. And I view myself as a policymaker that's going to keep those promises. But we also have to understand that for the viability of that system to survive, especially Medicare, 11 years from now, uh, where many retirees are still going to be utilizing that system. We need to make some changes for future generations so that this current system is still there and other options are available for younger generations. And when we do that, we're prolonging the solvency of a great system. And that's what our budget does. And you mentioned that the discretionary spending uh, in defense cuts. Well, I would argue with you that defense has been cut dramatically because of the failed policy of sequestration. And that's why I don't like the meat cleaver approach. I don't like across the board cuts because the Department of Defense has been cut 47% of the 2% cut in spending that sequestration gave in discretionary spending in Washington went to the Department of Defense and the military. This is the same military that the president now is saying is going to solve the problems in Syria without telling us how he plans to use our military to do so. And I think that's very concerning, which is why we've got to be, get back to the normal appropriations process where members of Congress in the House originate the spending bills and decide what's important and what's not important. And then the voters, the voters can better hold their elected representatives accountable for the decisions he or she make on each of those spending measures. And that's what our forefathers wanted in this system of government, and that's what our American taxpayer should demand. Before time grows uh, entirely out, let's move along. We haven't even discussed Obamacare, which was obviously one of the major issues. I would think, uh, aside from Syria being talked about, uh, that you probably hear a lot from your constituents about concerns about Obama Obamacare and, and the implementation thereof. That's a, uh, people are supposed to be signing up for October. Frankly, it keeps changing by the day as far as what's doable and what's not doable, and I'm not sure where the deadlines are anymore. Uh, one of the things House Republicans who control the House, the House Republicans have been uh, having a series of votes to unfund Obamacare. Uh, give, give us your... Uh, should, should the Republicans, as a strategy, is that a waste of time to be having these votes on trying to, to unfund Obamacare? And then just what are your thoughts overall on, on the going forward with this? Well, individual votes on defunding Obamacare are never going to be signed into law by the president. I get that. However, I think we need to still use the leverage of defunding or delaying and repealing and replacing Obamacare to get provisions passed that the president wants. I mean, the bottom line is, I agree with Senator Max Baucus, a Democrat from Montana, that the implementation of Obamacare is, is a train wreck and, and will be a train wreck. I'm for defunding Obamacare. I'm for delaying Obamacare. I'm for repealing and replacing Obamacare. I voted for a bill right before we left in August to actually delay the employer mandate, to codify the decision that President Obama unilaterally made, which I don't know if he has the constitutional authority to do that on his own. So. <laughs> To agree with him, we passed the bill delaying that. I would urge the Senate to take up that bill if they and the administration are serious about delaying the employer mandate. But we also passed a second bill to delay the individual mandate, which affects so many individuals and small businesses here in, in central and southwestern Illinois. I would urge the Senate to take that up because if they're going to delay the implementation for big businesses, they ought to do it for the mom and pop shops too. What about the exemptions that we hear about? The, the administration giving these little exceptions that it's not going to apply to this group or that group. Oh, I mean, there's the aspect of the equal protection of the law. Is it even a legal for the administration to be giving exempt exemptions to uh, various groups? 
Well, when government picks winners and losers, the American taxpayers are always the losers. Uh, government shouldn't be giving waivers to the health care provisions that they say are going to benefit the American people. Uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise, they should they should be implemented clearly. It just shows that there's problems with this with this bill that are not going to be solved. Promises were made that costs were going to go down and access was going to go up and those those promises have have been broken uh, we need to ensure that we slow this down and and frankly I'm concerned as an individual because uh, no matter what you hear Congress didn't exempt itself from going on the exchange uh, I as a member of Congress and my staff are the only federal employees that will have to go on to the Obamacare exchange uh, we don't yet have the answers what we're going to be able to choose from. How much is it going to cost? And in situations like my family, where my wife's a 14-year cancer survivor, I don't yet know if she's going to be able to continue to see the doctors that have been treating her for 14 years. That frustrates me, not only as a policymaker, but as a husband and a father. Uh, and many families are going through the same situation that I'm going through with uncertainty in what their health care is going to look like next year. That's why we need to slow this down. That's why we need to to come to our senses and replace this, this boondoggle 2,000 page bill with common sense reforms that will actually lower costs, provide more access, and cover things like pre-existing conditions and lift lifetime caps. You know, uh, one last issue let me bring up, and it's, uh, we just recently were talking uh, and covering the uh, Farm Progress Show, which is a major agricultural show that was held in Decatur, but people were there from uh, literally around the world. One of the big issues that we were talking to uh, some of the agricultural leaders about is the rebuilding of the locks and dams, the infrastructure spending uh, that needs to go on within America. And for those who don't know, something like 80% of all the jet fuel that's used at O'Hare Airport in Chicago comes up the Mississippi. We make, as a nation, billions of dollars in uh, trade, uh, trade dollars coming into America from the grain that goes through these locks and dams. But they're 70 years old now. They basically had a lifespan of 50 years, so they're kind of being held together by uh, duct tape and bailing wire. Uh, and yet, we can't get the government to finance the rebuilding uh, of these locks and dams that are so vital to the uh, ongoing uh, economy. Yeah. What's the holdup and what chances uh, do you see as far as actually having some progress made on getting the dollars to rebuild these? It's not just about getting the dollars, Terry. It's about getting the policies in place that will allow uh, the construction to be authorized and completed. Uh, that's what we were hoping to uh, address in September was the beginning of a WARDA bill. Uh, have we hearings. We use it's the term. Water Resource and Development Act. Um, but I'm afraid this serious situation because the president didn't ask us to come back and authorize the use of force or lack thereof this week that important issues like WARDA are going to be pushed pushed aside. And that's that's unfortunate because you're right. It, you have to have the infrastructure in the navigation channel along the Mississippi River to move our grain and move our coal. Folks don't realize the top two commodities that run down that river are coal and grain by a large margin. Coal mining jobs in McCoupin and Montgomery County, they rely upon being able to get that coal overseas because there are people in Washington that say you can't burn it as much here in this country. Uh, that's why it's crucial. But we have to have policies in place that will allow the Corps of Engineers to authorize the construction projects so that we finally get these updated locks and dams. Uh, barge operators, those who use the lock and dam system in the navigation channel, are willing to pay a higher fee as long as they know that the money's going to go toward building projects. And that's why uh, Congresswoman Sherry Bustos and I have, have introduced the uh, Public-Private Partnership Act to allow more public-private partnerships and, and reduce the time it takes for the Corps of Engineers to authorize and construct these projects, which even right now, the Corps estimates at full funding under, current, under the current regulatory environment, it would take them 40 years if they had all the money in hand to complete the renovations of the locks and dams. Why would it take 40? I mean, as we sit here, uh, Panama, which has a fraction of our budget, obviously, the small country of Panama is rebuilding the Panama Canal. Uh, they're probably going to have it done within a period of five years from start to finish. 
Why would it take the United States 40 years to construct new locks and dams? It's the regulatory environment that's in place in Washington right now, which is why it's crucial that we have opportunities to change the way Washington operates, speed up the construction of very integral projects like this, so that we can be more on, more on par with Panama. <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but that's what it takes and, and that's what has happened in Washington right now where the regulatory environment slows down progress and I view my job in Washington as, as one to, to rein that regulatory environment in in a very sensible way so that the, the American taxpayers are not hurt uh, by doing so but also we need to make sure that our economy is not hurt uh, by the lack of construction of new locks and dams. I know I'm very typical probably of a lot of people. We just don't pay that much attention. We've grown up to agriculture. We've grown up in urban areas. Uh, and yet, uh, I will remind my fellow uh, people living here that uh, agriculture is our number one industry in Illinois. Uh, and in just talking to some of the uh, people who work in this field, they were saying countries like Brazil can do this uh, in many ways cheaper than us. And the one saving grace is America's transportation that if we don't rebuild the transportation system, we're going to lose that edge on the world agricultural market. And with it, billions of dollars in uh, profits that comes into the country, as well as uh, uh, a lot of jobs. Um, so Congressman Rodney Davis, uh, we appreciate you sharing your thoughts. I know time grows short and you have Thank other you. things to do, but uh, hopefully we can meet again. And we appreciate you taking the time now to share your thoughts with us. Thank you, Terry. Always glad to, and uh, great to see you again. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.